Now you already had uh, two speakers and now it's my turn. I don't know whether this will kill you or what. <laughs> Hopefully not. But I will start off by saying two things from what the two speakers have said. You know, she wondered how the Gen Y can listen to music and can still study, can still work, she cannot. How Generation Y can watch a Korean movie, can still study, pass the exam, but she cannot. But at my age, which is past 60, that is not my issue. My issue is when my wife is around, I cannot do anything. <laughs> How many of you share this? <laughs> and that's the truth. When I was married to my wife 39 years ago, when I was a student, by the way, in, this was in UK, <sighs> we can't stop talking to each other. <laughs> Partly because I was in London, she was in Manchester. When we met, we talked and talked and talked. Today, I realize we don't talk. <laughs> At night, when I get to the bed with her, she's always on her handphone. If ever she makes a call, it's to the children. She never calls me, she never SMS me. So uh, opening my speech by this statement, I think you'll be wondering if there's something wrong with my family or what. Kind of <laughs> but to be honest with you, uh, my marriage has never been better. Lah. You know? uh, 39 years of no problems. Uh, I've enjoyed it and I think she has done a great job. So this is one thing, Sakina, the challenges are different with different age. Like, uh, but again, I have no problem with my wife. I love my wife very much. There's no problem with that. <coughs> uh, of course, I will not say this if she's around uh, today. You know? <laughs> now, Prof Hamza mentioned something about, you know, uh, People telling him, hey, stop this university, don't carry on with it. I hear worse things than him. And the worst thing, the chairman tells me that. Chairman tells hey, guys, kita jual je lelit sini, we can make some money, you know. The name is good, good branding, we sell it. The chairman telling you that. How do you feel? And the chairman has been telling that since I was still the vice chancellor. But it is still alive today. The, you know, the university is still around. So let me tell you the biggest challenge to this job that Hamza has gone through. You know what is the biggest challenge? Let me ask you. The biggest challenge is your own board. You know, you believe that? Could be internal. Your board. Your board. Your professor is number two. Even though Sakina keeps saying, you know, you must get your professors be with you and so on. The professors are a source of great irritant, but never mind. <laughs> they have to publish the paper and so on, forgive it. But the, 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 the members of the board, as the chairman and so on, sometimes you, know, you wonder what do they do. You know? Their job is always to tell what is wrong with your idea. That has been my experience for so many years. But I tell you, <coughs> don't worry about it because I've gone through so many boards in fact, one of the board that I sat in, and he was chairman for three years, he was a minister before that. And when he was minister, I quarreled with him. And after the election, he became my chairman. <laughs> and I thought when they appointed him as chairman, they wanted to kick me out, you know. But miracles happened in life. He became my chairman, and today he's one of my best friends. Whenever I meet him, we will hug. Only the Arabs do that, right? <laughs> but we hug, you know. <laughs> so, the fact of the matter is this, we may quarrel in the board meeting and so on, we may shout. And by the way, in the UMW board, I do shout once in a while. Is that correct, Amda? I have to stop the chairman from saying nonsense. Isn't it? You know? And for me, he can't do anything. I'm no more in UM. So I have to be tough with him. Hamza cannot do that. Because Hamza being the president, if we were trying to offend the chairman, he may not get a salary rise. <laughs> For me, it doesn't matter. Uh, but at the end of the day, what is important, outside the meeting, we have to be friends. Forget all your problems. Right there. That, that is the true spirit of what this is all about. 
So that is to give you the background to myself. I'm not as patient as Hamza, let me tell you. I'm not. Um, my wife does complain about that too. Why can't you just slow down by 10 kilometers? You know? But it is okay, I still survive. <laughs> Next slide. Now, actually, uh, what I'm going to talk about today is, qu quite honestly, the most challenging problem today. And this is a problem where we have to address it and we cannot hide it under the carpet. And what is that problem? It's money. Because to be honest with you, somebody told me recently, money is like fuel to anything. You know? Without money, nothing works. And that's exactly our current problem in this country. Uh, funding for higher education, we slash, you see the graph. Again, I got this from the media. Uh, the, the next slide. You will see from this slide, you know, these are the cuts that was already announced by the government. And if you look at it, for example, in Malaya, 268 million cut, UITM 946 million, and so on. The public universities are really tight. This is public data, this is not uh, confidential data. <coughs> If you are running a university which runs on an operating budget of 600 million, and suddenly one year the government tells you, we are going to cut you 300 million, will you survive? In one year you are running at 600 million, the next year later, 300 million out. Can you do the job or not? What do you think? That is the truth. This, these are public data. This is actually what the public university is now facing. Do you all know that or not? And it looks to the public like the university is surviving, but from my knowledge, from my friends, from the professors I know, from the bystanders I know, they are crying. Because nobody in the university system really knows how to solve it. Nobody currently, whether it is the board or the management, knows the solution to this problem with this kind of cuts. Because what kind of business can actually give you 300 million a year? That is a very huge business, right? And that's exactly the problem. So the budget cuts that was announced and so on results in this kind of figures. And Prof. Anza was mentioning that uh, with the autonomy given to a number of the universities, especially the research university, they expect 30% cut, and that's exactly the effect. Lah. This exactly the fact. The government is doing exactly what they have said. So you are given autonomy. You can do whatever you want according to whatever has been laid down, uh, financial autonomy, human resource, academic, and so on. So free, you can do. But to be honest with you, go to any of the public industry, yeah maybe you hear ideas here and there. But can anyone come up with all this figure every year? You all realize the problem? And that's exactly what I've always been interested in. And there was one forum here where they did with the Kedendi School of Government where I mentioned if the government continue with this card, Unions will go bankrupt within three to five years. I made that statement and I still maintain it today. Because UM cannot survive that. People may say, oh, UM can buy endowment. The endowment is very big. But they didn't know that those endowments cannot be used. Those endowments come with various stipulations on how the money is to be used. It's not that you don't have money, just use that. No. The actual amount of money that UM can use is a small fraction of that. This is the thing. And UM is the richest university in Malaysia, put it like that. UM is the richest, no doubt about that. Richer than Sunway, richer than anybody. But it is having problems today. Now, if you think the public university has problems, don't you think private university has problems? What do you think? Private universities in Malaysia have lots of problems. 
you only need to do a survey how many universities have been sold, have changed hands, changed ownership. Many, man. Right or not? Yes. So only a madman will want to come inside a private university. Because it's a sure way to lose a lot of money. Did you hear that, what I say? But, ladies and gentlemen, today I've come to tell one story. This is at the end of how one university, not in Malaysia, how they have become very rich and very successful under very difficult times also. And what is that model that they use? I'm going to tell at the end. At the beginning, I'm going to frighten you all first. <laughs> With all the sad stories. By the way, Hamza was mentioning that uh, when I told the PM, sorry, the higher education minister, Khalid Nordi at that time, that I want a license to set up with wealth one they give. Let me tell you the truth. You may be wondering uh, about the job of vice chancellor. Let me tell you, if the vice chancellor is aggressive enough, he gets everything he wants. You believe that? I've got everything I wanted from the minister. He never said no to me. Actually, I think his tactic was just avoid me so that he won't ask me. <laughs> but I got everything. And let me mention two things that I got which was very significant. One, I told him, Dato, I want a private industry license. I want to marry Wales and UM and I want to set up a private industry. And I want this in 10 years' time to be money generating for UM. Okay, go ahead. Simple as that. No paper, nothing. This is the kind of lesson I want to tell the vice chancellors today. You know. Rather than, you know, don't be such a good boy. <laughs> be brave. T say what you want. The second thing I asked from him, and this was even better. And you see this ranking of UM? UM in the QS ranking has been going up, right? Uh, actually, this was me here. I was VC still here from 2008 to 2013. And here was the new vice chancellor. <coughs> it was going up all the time in the QS ranking. How did we do it? Well, in 2011 here, Oh, when I was appointed VC, I said I must bring up the ranking of UM because that is what I promised the interview board. Because they asked me, what do I want to do? I say I want to make UM the number one university again. So I went to the minister, I said, sir, in order to push UM to become the number one in Malaysia again, I want to push for high class, top class research in UM. And for that, I've calculated, I met all the deans, and we estimate that we need about 800 million. 800 million ringgit for high impact research. Did I get it or not? When I told him this, what did he tell me, you think? No, he didn't say go it because he doesn't have that money. He told me, Gauss, prepare a cabinet paper. I prepared the cabinet paper. So a month after that, it came back, you are approved 600 million to be spent over five years. In addition to the annual research budget that we get. So, again, the minister never said, no, 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 cannot, that's too much. Uh, the other universities will complain. No. Actually, the other universities are complaining. Why UM got it? But who cares? Because... UM has to play its proper role as the number one university again. And I was told to do that anyway. So I got 600 million and that's what? Uh, the ranking has been going up. But that money has run out now. <laughs> I don't know whether the new vice chancellor will shout or not. <laughs> will be willing to force on the minister or not. I don't know. So now you know the secret of getting things. What is it? Shout and be firm, right? <laughs> and threaten. <laughs> I hope this video is at so that all the vice chancellors will learn this technique because that's what I use anyway. 
and I got them. Of course, there's one other thing I asked from the minister. This is top secret. I cannot tell you. <laughs> so I keep that aside. It's rather sensitive, but never mind. So, ladies and gentlemen, the whole talk I'm going to convey to you today is based on one premise. Go and look for ideas, push for the ideas, and get the ideas into reality. If you are just going to follow the normal stream and so on, forget it. You are not going to do anything. And these troubled times, these very trying times, needs leaders who are like that, in my opinion. I don't care if the other vice chancellors are angry with me, but I'm telling you that needs to be done now. Because money is scarce, you have to come up with ideas. Because if you are just going to depend on the ministry giving you money, the board coming with ideas, it's not going to happen. Times are tough. Okay, another fact I must, uh, before I go back to the slides. In 2013, when I'm not renewed, I was vice chancellor for only five years. Thank God, only for five years. If I'm still around, I'm not sure what I am today. I might not be able to come and give this talk, maybe. <laughs> because I might be so depressed. But 2013, after being uh, vice chancellor for five years, I decided not to apply for any job. Anything that I will do after 2013, it has to come to me. You believe that? I'm just testing myself. And I'm risking. Because, you know, when you don't have money, when you don't have salary, when you don't go to work, you know who's going to get angry? What? Not the minister. <laughs> <laughs> it's your wife. You, if you want to live long with your wife, you better understand all this. Because you have nothing to do, the first to question you is your wife. <clears throat> A lot of breakups, do you know that the statistic is because of economic reason, right? Quickly find a job if you lose one. <laughs> and to digress, I have a friend, oh my God, he failed in his business, he lost all his money, and just like what I said, the in-law said, you divorced my daughter. Believe that? I know of a friend who is like that. If, if, the, if the wife doesn't ask for it, the, your mother-in-law. <laughs> When I finish my term, a few interesting offers come to me. The offers that I reject flatly are to become presidents of universities. There were two offers I reject. I don't want it anymore. Okay? Even though they are willing to pay high, I say I don't want. I don't want to damage my reputation. <laughs> because maybe I cannot repeat what I've done before. But I accepted all those that come to me, which is not full-time. Board membership and so on. So I, I'm in, a, in several boards, about six or seven boards. Uh, universities board, college board, company boards. Okay? And among the two that come to me, which I never expected in my life, but which made the difference and which actually gave me motivation to talk today, are from two banks. One is Citibank. I'm a board member of Citibank. But you know, Citibank is a bank that is very thorough in their search. They hired a headhunter. I was interviewed six times before I finally got the job. <laughs> when it came to the third interview, I said, forget it. Lah. At my age, they still want to interview me. My CV is not enough. <laughs> but I was interviewed. I never believed I got that job. Because I know nothing about finance, you know. I, I don't know how to... Really, when I go to the Citibank board meeting, it's a real struggle, you know. But somehow their policy is to get people from different backgrounds into the board. So that they have different perspective of issues. And, but honestly, I can't follow. All sorts of committee and so on. But they are very thorough. And God, I don't know how I got it. In the third MCU, the chairman of Citibank Malaysia, which is an American, asked me one question. Last question. And I thought it was a killer question. 
Sir, what would you contribute to us if we bring you to the board? <laughs> How to answer this question? <laughs> and actually, I was prepared for it. I say, maybe I have to talk something about finance and so on, you know. Difficult question, right? For somebody who doesn't have a finance banking background. So wait till the end, I tell you the answer. <laughs> <laughs> but I got the job, lah. But I saw a different perspective in the banking world. In the banking world, everything is perfection. No excuses. Make one mistake, your bonus is affected. Make one mistake, you are on your way out. Not in the academic world. In the academic world, there are a lot of forgiveness for you. <laughs> That's what I realized. You will be forgiven and forgiven and forgiven. In the banking sector, no way. They pay you high, but they kill you if you make a mistake. And sometimes, a mistake made by your people down your level. But what is great about being in the banking sector, you realize what the money world is all about, and you realize what are the opportunities there. And when I was UM as a vice chancellor, I thought that was my world. But I tell you the truth, the academic world is a small world. The world outside there, the world of business is bigger than education anytime. But when I meet professors, I say, oh, academic is good, CSR, lah, this and so on. Make people feel nice. <laughs> and you have to respect the professors anyway. But when I get to the bank, I see a totally different world. If you think, eh, hey, nature doesn't have money, lah, to lah. Somewhere else there are plenty of money. Somewhere else there are plenty of money. 20, 30 billion ringgit is nothing. Somewhere else. And that I want to tell you. So this is what I discovered in the banking, in the money world. So with that in mind, I say actually there is a solution for all these budget cuts in the university. Actually there is a solution. Only that. You guys in the academic world is always focused to <laughs> your world. And I thank God that I was not extended after five years because I saw a different world out there. This is the truth. But of course, uh, I say I was a, I'm a Citibank board member. The other bank I cannot tell you because that's rather confidential. But that bank can give you anything you want. Anything you want. For that, you have to come and see me in private. <laughs> because that happens to be part of my business dealings now. But really, if you talk about 1 billion, 2 billion, 5 billion, 10 billion, nothing. Honestly. Okay? If the people in the academic world suffering, no money, where to find the money, that's because they're academic. But in the finance world, it's a different story. Go back. Okay, you see, Prime Minister, 7 September 2015, made this statement to just stress the point that actually, hey, public university, don't just depend on the government. You are supposed to find 30% yourself. He made this statement, see? So actually, the cuts that have come now is something the government has been telling the public university anyway. You know, only that the... The university system, especially the public system, is just not reacting to it. There are many reasons for that, but I give one very good reason why they are not reacting. Because everybody in the board is appointed by the minister. That's the problem. Do you know that everybody in the public university board is appointed by the minister of education? Do you know that or not? Yeah, I'm telling you. Not only those in the board, but also the top management of the university. <coughs> that is why, ma'am, the vice chancellor has to behave. <laughs> That's why you have to behave. You have to say nice things. You understand? <coughs> but that is also partly the reason why nothing happens. You know what I mean? Now, this is partly the problem with the public university system today. 
I've sat in the University of Malaya board before I went to Multimedia University. I've sat for five years uh, when I was vice chancellor. <sighs> it gets nowhere, la, honestly. Okay, so that's the truth about public university board. T to be honest with you, and I'm not trying to to jack anybody, one of the best boards I've set is the Sunway University Board. This is the truth. Because uh, I think the chairman is intelligent, he opens up for discussion, he's willing to listen to anything, which surprised me because I thought, you know, the, 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 the private industry board will not be like that. Uh, I was in uh, one private industry board, the only person who does the talking is the chairman. <laughs> Everybody else keep quiet. If you talk, you are not going to last. <laughs> but anyway, I, I will not go deeper on that. Any, anyway, uh, compliments to all the public see All the ranking have been going up. And UM is currently ranked 114 in the QS ranking. And just hoping that one or two more years, this breaks into the top 100. Then we make another history lah for Malaysia. Just hope for that. <coughs> Just hope all this high impact research will continue to give the impact and push up the ranking lah, hopefully. But in my own uh, calculation, this cannot last very long because with the cuts in budget, how do you sustain that? Okay, next slide. Now, why are the tuition costs so high? I've been wondering this, why in the US? You know, I know some of my friends who send their children to Nebraska, lah, to Iowa, crazy, they spend so much money. <coughs> and actually, finally, I found the answer summarized by this last line. Actually, the education budget has grown 10 times, even compared to the military budget of the US. Education is very expensive, isn't it, in the U.S., you know? And if you look at that, the pattern is exactly the same as what is happening in Malaysia now. And what is the reason uh, why, the, why, why the spending has grown up? Because you look at that, public funding for higher education has been slashed, continues to be slashed, exactly like what has just happened in Malaysia. Okay, you see like UM has to raise 280 million or whatever. So that's fundamental reason. Public spending is less, cost is going up. So you may be thinking, why are these increases? Is it the professors have been much more paid now? Actually, that is a wrong belief too. The professors are not being paid much more. We'll see in the next slide. And this is what happens in uh, Harvard, I believe, where, you know, in February 70, uh, they announced the increase of tuition from $200 to $2,600. Today is $45,000. And it's going to continue to go, go up. And they have done the calculation that if you actually take from that period 70 until today, actually, if it has gone according to inflation, CPI, the what how about should be charging is only fifteen thousand dollars, but actually it's forty five thousand dollars, and I tell you there's no end to this. I think even Harvard cannot solve this problem now. Even though Harvard is the richest university in the world, right? You know that, and do you know who which university is the second richest in the world? Guess. Harvard is number one, second richest. No, 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 expert, Cambridge below there. MIT down there. <laughs> UM? No, 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 no. No, no, no. no, no. Actually, Yale. There, there's a graph. Go on, next one. And even in the UK, now the government is uh, giving more flexibility that the universities can decide their own fees, you know, because of the rising costs. Even in UK, has gone to that direction, okay? I can't spend so much time on this. Next slide. Okay, where is the increased college tuition spent on? And here is the answer. Again, from this particular art 
article, you can have my slide, you can Google this. And it says that actually the salaries of professors hasn't really gone up. The admin cost that has gone up. And admin cost here means all the administrators, the number of them that you employ together with all the administrative systems and so on. That keeps rising. Your computer system, la, your network, la, your international networking and so on. But the actual salaries and wages for professors is roughly the same. So don't blame the professors. Huh? Please appreciate that job. <laughs> so understand that costs keep rising because of administrative costs. That's why I think there's rationale for what Prof Sakina is saying. How do we cut down the cost? But actually in Prof Sakina's sp uh, slides, she mentioned some elements of technology, but there are two technologies that will be significant. One is MOOCs, I think. I think you mentioned a bit about that. And the second technology that will become very important is AI, artificial intelligence. I read an article, but of course I cannot put into all this too much, that very soon a lot of lecturers will have no jobs <laughs> with AI. I mean, it is surprising that even lawyers will be out of work. Okay, so many, many jobs will be eradicated, including lecturer's job. So, the academics in this room, please, early warning. <laughs> you have to reinvent yourself and see your relevance after that. Okay, how you can remain relevant and how you can become still employable. Because certain functions like marking of exam papers, setting... I don't know what it is. Are all things that AI can do in the future. By the way, holding this also now, a lot of AI is helping you, isn't it? <laughs> Suddenly you see, hey, you match this girl. No? Do you see that function? This is one thing you never show your wife, isn't it? <laughs> they can even tell what are the films you like, what are the hobbies you have, what kind of personality you have. AI is doing the job, you know. And what else in future, I don't know. Uh, so actually, that's another big area where it's going to take away a lot of our jobs, by the way. So professors, think of something where nobody, the AI cannot follow. Lah. The one area that I was told that AI cannot follow is the artist job. Uh, the AI, the most sophisticated AI software cannot paint. So maybe art is another profession to take up soon. <laughs> <laughs> Next slide, Ali. Uh, in order to touch on why we want to talk about this subject, I have to talk about world-class universities. And this, I think, has a lot of relevance to Sunway University, which aims to, you know, Sunway University is really aiming to go up in ranking. And I think not only Sunway University, right? Taylor's is talking the same, la, and so on. This is a report by a World Bank report which talks about the criteria to build a world-class university. Three things. Top performing research university share three common characteristics. A high concentration of talented academics and students. High quality academic staff and students. You, you know, to build a top class university. Okay. So when you recruit, make sure you try to recruit the best possible. Okay? Uh, significant budget. This is my obsession today. How to help university out of this budget problem. And strategic vision and leadership. These three things are difficult to do. These three things cannot be done without money. Only with money you can have these three things. You know? uh, to get a good leader to run a private university, you have to pay them high. They have to pay high because not appointing the right person may cause you huge losses. You must understand that concept. And for them, just like if you are CEO of a bank, you are set very high targets. Next year, you must increase another 1.5 billion in profit. Targets like that. But they pay you handsomely. Okay? So you must have a leader 
that is really excellent. You must have big, good budgets, and you have uh, top class professors and so on. Talking about budgets, this is where I think a lot of universities are going to fail. Because a lot of universities in Malaysia depends a lot of it on collection of student fees. Is this right? Everybody is just looking at the fees. So when the, when the fees have been increasing, student numbers have been dropping, revenue has been dropping. The, it's a vicious cycle, you know. Because what I know a lot of universities, their main income is student fees. So <clears throat> this is the, now the first fatal mistake of how we have been going around establishing universities. Actually, establishing, establishing private universities is not meant for the businessmen. You know who should set up? Who should be given licenses to set up private universities? Who? Don't give it to a businessman. It will fail. Because the first thing they think, how do I make money from the university? So who are the right, who are the kind of people that we should give the license to? Now, eh, starting now, in my opinion. No, 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 no. Academics know how to waste money, yes. <laughs> But who are the people that should rightfully be given licenses to set up university if they want? Who do you think? No. People who doesn't know what to do with their money. <laughs> Honestly. Because if you are based on a model like 99% of the universities today where you're based on collection of fees, anything happens to the economy, you're immediately affected. Right? but people who doesn't know what to do with their money, like those who started all these big, big endowments in the U.S., they gave away thousands of acres of land, uh, <clears throat> a few billion, and so on. That is the kind of people that should be given the license. Not people who say, I'll make money from here. Do you all agree or not? I've already commented a lot about the public university and the problem. I've said that the public university, the biggest problem is you have leaders who are not forceful enough, not brave enough. I've also mentioned that most of the public university board members are sleeping and not really moving. You can tell them I said it, I have no problem. <laughs> you know, I'm sure they have heard about it. But now I'm telling about the private university a lot of people who, I have people who come to me proper, I'm going to get a university license. Hey, we can make money from this. They tell me that. Whoever set up a university because they think they can become multi-millionaire, that's the worst person to give. And I believe the Ministry of Higher Education is not setting good enough criteria because I've seen the criteria. To get a uh, university college, I think uh, 20 million, lah, things like that. Lah. Hey, this is not good enough. I think you must put there at least 1 billion first endow to set up. It must be that kind of criteria. Then only we can feel safe that the institution that is uh, established will survive. Do you all agree or not? Honestly, this is a problem today because 99% of the private colleges and private universities is dependent on collection of fees. So when in economic downturn, when PTPTN amount is cut, everybody starts to suffer. I've known private university where at the height of the, the peak of their performance, they have 23,000 students, now it's down to 15,000. My God, I say, how are they going to push back? I've, I know of a few private universities where at the height, they were 20 over 1,000 students, now they are down by 30%. When it is down by 30%, it is very critical, anything goes wrong, you are out today. 
you have to cut stuff, you have to remove stuff, you have to increase fees. And you come to a point where the, 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 the numbers don't add up anymore. And this is coming right now. There are some private university owners desperate to sell. A lot of owners will tell you, okay, I'm willing to give this away for 200 million. But actually, you can get it for 50 million, you know. You believe that? You believe that? Anybody got 50 million? <laughs> but still, I will tell you, don't buy that university. You know why? Because you are, you are buying 50 million worth of problems. Where when you come in, you have to pump a lot more money to solve all their internal problems. They may have litigation problem, they may have system problem, and so on and so on. It's messy. When an owner decides to abandon sheep, because if he's doing well, why would he, what would he sell, right? He would keep it. Please remember this. Next slide. I have put this. Of course, the World Bank report has summarized it into three things. Top class researchers and students, great budget, and a leader. Actually, this is a listing from the Times Higher Education Ranking. There was one article where they say, if you want to go up in ranking, do, do the following. I think you can Google this and you will get this uh, article, eh? Times Higher Education. So they seem to have jumbled up everything. But some of it is... Uh, Quite relevant and pertinent, I think. Okay. <clears throat> if you look at all this criteria they put, it keeps recurring. It's all about hire the best, know the talent, get the best leaders, okay, incentivize racing, research, and so on. The higher education business is all about putting in money to get quality. That's what it is all about. Invest in technology so that invest in the best people so that in, invest in getting the best students so that it's all money. You know. So don't give it to those businessmen who want to make money from the business. It's not going to work. I will not go in detail because I don't have time. Next slide. <coughs> so again, uh, you can read this because it's interesting because Times Higher Education itself is recommending universities to, to do all this. But it's interesting, number 15, tell the government no. Remember, I get it from Times Higher Education ranking. I don't want any government people to say, how come I write this down? I didn't. I just copied. Tell the government no. When do you tell the government no? When do you tell the government no? I know you all will not answer this. <laughs> the government, the minister, or their agents will always be contacting you for this and for that, right? And a lot of things are unexpected things that you must do this and you must do that. So the idea here is that the government doesn't have your problem, where your problem is to balance budget, your problem is to plan for things, and so on. The government never knows this. But the government very often, of course, if it is something that everybody has to do with regard to raising quality, what? Yes, you must do. That one is a different matter. But there are unexpected, unscheduled things that you have to do which you have to say no. Actually, the best leaders are the people who can say no, isn't it? You agree? The best parents are those who can say no to their children, right? You agree? The most loved father is the one who, gi who says yes to everything. And later, the father will cry. <laughs> <laughs> you agree, sir? <laughs> True. <laughs> Never mind. Let's go on to the next slide. <clears throat> okay. What I really want to touch here is the issue about university endowment. Because I think none of the universities in Malaysia talks about this really. But I believe if we want to survive as an education hub and so on, this is what we should be talking about now. 
And in the US, in their higher education system, in their school system, they have already been talking about this a long time. And I'm going to reveal you some facts where it may surprise you. Okay, so please tell Tan Sri Jeffrey Cha, tell anybody, start thinking about endowment. Because endowment is the only thing that can, endowment is the shock absorber against any problems in the economy and so on. Of course, I already told you, you see Malaya has the biggest endowment. Can you name any other universities that has, that has big endowment in Malaysia? Any, any other universities? Let me just explain to you that endowments is actually financial assets that are donated. This word donation is quite popular, isn't it? I mean, donated to the university and you keep it there. You don't touch it. You don't touch the principal sum. Whatever dividends you get from there, part of it, use it, part of it, plow back to make sure that the endowment keeps growing to be inflation adjusted. Okay? This is what I'm talking about when we talk about endowment. <coughs> and if you read this, these are... Money, this is land, this is building, and so on, given, endowed. Okay? So, one is donated, another is investment. Money or building, you rent it out, you make more money, and so on. So, the two keywords for endowment is donation and investment. So, sometimes the other word for donation is endowed. Okay? I think... The Ministry of Higher Education, the Minister should start asking people to start talking about endowment. Endowment not in the sense they go to your alumni and ask them for donation, but endowment in this other sense, in the next slide. Okay, uh, this is just to summarize from the Harvard webpage, what the use of endowment for, student financial aid, teaching, research, innovation, and so on. A lot of use. Next slide, Ani. Okay, and then how the money is being used because uh, some is brought back to increase the principal sum, some is being used. Okay, that's the fundamental of endowment. Next slide. And here, uh, Harvard being the richest since in the world has 37.6 billion as of 2015. They even have a company dedicated people to manage their financial resources. You know, endowment is such an important aspect of the university. Next. And the detail about the award management company is this. Okay. This one, you can read it. I won't go into detail. Next slide. And you just imagine... <coughs> Jack Meyer, who was the boss of HMC from 1990 to 2005, from an endowment of $4.8 billion, at the time he lived, it was worth $25.9 billion, <coughs> giving a return of 16% a year. <coughs> what investment can give you this high? So from here, we can see how Harvard has grown their value up, uh, you know, from... 4.8 to become 25.9 billion. Actually, it is possible because you need good fund managers. I know, you know, when I was in the University of Malaya, there are some funds where the return can be 20% a year. Possible. But not easy to find, but there are people who can do that for you. And all this is legal. These are through investment banks and so on. And so these are the sort of thing that we must be looking at for the public as well as private industry. You may be thinking, ah, in the private industry, don't worry, the, the president, the, the vice chancellor runs the university. The money part, leave it to, <coughs> to the owners or the founders. <coughs> but I think that's the first mistake. Why the first mistake? Because can we trust the founder anyway? Can we trust him to do like what he's saying? Because at the end of the day, if something goes wrong, nobody knows the founder. They will say, this vice chancellor is useless. He spent all the money. It's people like Hamza and Sakina who gets all the blame. 
So a lot of them will tell, no, 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 uh, we take care of the money part. We will get profit here and give you back. No, actually, a good industry setup is for them to tell us how much endowment there is and how are you going to invest this and how are you going to generate money for industry. One. Secondly, how much of all the income is from tuition and how much from endowment? The thing has to change. If they say 80% is from tuition fees, the model is like the old, you know, like, like what is happening now. And that's a very risky model, actually. And as I say, I will come to one example of university where anything happens in the world, that university will survive because of the endowment. But anyway, the second gentleman, Muhammad El Arian, uh, succeeded him in two years. He brought in uh, returns of 23%. So good money, isn't it? You know that that uh, we should be looking for this kind of people who can create and grow your endowment. And this is the direction we should be looking at. And all universities should have an endowment committee, and this committee should declare what money they have, what are their targets, and what are they achieving. Then that's comfort for the academics, for the students, and so on. Next slide. Okay, the second richest university is actually Yale. MIT is there. Uh, Harvard and Cambridge is not here, but of course, they are British University. So MIT, even though it's among the top in the world, but Harvard is better. More money. Eh? Next slide. Okay, the world's 20 wealthiest university. That's the ranking. So, number three is from Saudi Arabia, actually. King Abdullah University. They have lots of money. They can pay you very, very high. And Cambridge and uh, Oxford. Oxford is here, number 17. And uh, Cambridge is number 13. Still, the U.S. Uh, is better. But of course, yeah, um, they say somehow U.S. is a very philanthropic nation. They, if you work out on a per capita basis, the Americans give more money to charity and so on. Okay, better than anywhere else in the world. But I will tell you something, size of endowment and so on doesn't last also. I think it's very much uh, <clears throat> affected by the wealth of the country. And as you know now, at one time, China was poor, no billionaires. But today, the number of billionaires, I think, is only 20 or 30 percent less than the U.S. A lot more billionaires are coming up in China. And China is a bigger population. So actually, U.S. under Donald Trump is under threat. <laughs> in so many different ways, including their universities. I will not be surprised that 10 or 20 years from now, some of the China universities be here. Trust me. Why? Because China University operates in a Ch China, which is a wealthy nation now, becoming more and more wealthy. Uh, so this won't last. But nevertheless, the message is this, that the future is through endowment. Investment of endowment and how the endowment support the industry. Next slide. Anyway, this is for your information. Not all universities in the U.S. is wealthy anyway. But everybody is trying to set up endowment. Not easy. Okay? Of course, uh, none of the Malaysian university can get into any of this. Lah. Susah. <laughs> uh, so if you look at the median... Of the 4,000 universities, 7.9 million dollars endowment only. Eh? So, but this is a mix lah. 4,000 universities in Malaysia is a total is about 300 over only, kan? Never mind. This is just for information. Next slide. Now, this is very very important. This is what I'm trying to illustrate to all of you: how uh, Yale built their wealth and so on. Generally, it's the same story with Harvard and so on. In the 85s. The endowment is put into four areas. 
the green, which is the U.S. equity, which is very safe, written, are guaranteed. U.S. bonds, again, you know, this is guaranteed by the American government. The economy was much better then and so on. So safe. And then the red, foreign equity, and then the <coughs> real estate and so on. From 80, 1985, the mix of their investment to today, 2016, it has broken up into smaller, smaller uh, portions. You know? It is interesting because if you look at what they write, its endowment target asset allocation is just shows a steady shift towards investment with bigger risk and reward. In order to build up your endowment, your endowment income, in order for it to give you 20, 25%, you have to take bigger risk. Simple as that. Bigger risk means bigger outcome. No risk means lesser. So you need a very competent bunch of people to manage all, manage all your assets. But the fact is, this is what they do. They are investing in so many things. Next slide. So this is just to uh, list out what are the areas. Eh? Has any of the Malaysian institution think about this? I'm very sure it's none, you know. Whatever they may have is just whatever they have been having for 20, 30 years since then. Next slide. Now, this is interesting. When I first started studying endowment and so on, I found a very interesting article where some of the top league universities in the U.S. was criticized for what they call the land grab issue. What is the land grab issue? All these wealthy universities start buying very, very cheap land in Africa, in Eastern Europe, and so on. Like uh, Harvard University, I think they have 150,000 acres in Africa. Uh, they have 30 or 40,000 acres in Romania, for example. Can you ever imagine Harvard University having 150,000 acres in Africa? Can you imagine? Have you ever thought of that? In Africa, no. Would you buy any land in, I don't know, Namibia? Would you, ma'am? <laughs> but they are already doing it, and they are criticized for it, not because it is not a good return, but because they bought that big pieces of land. People who have been living on the land have been chased out, and they have been slow to develop the land, so the farmers and so on are not getting return. So they become poorer. So the land grab by all these top universities is causing people to be more impoverished. They are criticized for that. But actually it brings return to them. And they may own it for 100 years. I mean 99 years. So ladies and gentlemen, if before this you don't know what is the extent of what endowment means, they even buy land in Africa. Please remember that. Okay? So, Sakina, where are you going to buy your land now? <laughs> I wonder if Sakina brings to the Mara board and says, hey, I'm going to look for a piece of land in Liberia. Have you heard of Liberia? Or the Congo. And I think there is a 50,000 acres there. Uh, per acre is about 2,000 ringgit. Do you think the Mara board will agree? <laughs> Your immediate response was no, but I'm telling you, yes, in Malaysia, you say this idea, they will think like that. But this rich news is already doing it. You know, I mean, I find this amusing, interesting, because it shows how far behind we are compared to them. And that's why they become so rich. You know, and I know of another article where Harvard University have some uh, problem uh, with their land that they purchased in Romania, 30,000 acres. I also don't know what they want to do with the 30,000 30, acres in Romania, but they have this property. So among the things I will tell you, Sakina, please go and buy land. If you are scared of Africa, don't go very far. Indonesia maybe. If you have no appetite for Indonesia, buy some land in Malaysia first. 
let's try that whether you can actually buy or not. But I'm saying this in a way like jokingly, but I think the future requires you to think this way. You have to think this way if you want to be a positive contributor to industry board. You must have this thing in mind and not consider this as like like a joke because this is what they are doing anyway. You don't have to believe me. Google the article, read them. It's all in the internet anyway. Okay, but you all don't seem convinced, right? <laughs> Isn't it? Next slide. Okay, now I'm going to. Sunway University wants to get into the ranking tables, wants to compete, and wants one day to be the best private university in Malaysia. Maybe one day wants to be, be better than UM. Possible or not? How? By learning Africa first or what? <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm all for it. I'm a member, board member of Sunway University, yes. But I think the way we drive our Sunway University, the way we go forward has to change. If not, no chance. Because if Sunway University is very much dependent on fees, we will not make it. Of course, the public university all this while has been able to make it because government guarantee their existence. Government will keep on pumping money. But not in the case of Sunway, not in the case of Unimara, not in the case of Multimedia University, not in the case of Utah. So, because uh, Sunway University and so on has to look at the model of Harvard. Make your money. Now, it's interesting as a university in Taiwan, uh, sorry, in uh, Korea, such an amazing university. I, I'm still researching, I'm asking my assistant to look for more data, but Pohang, or in short, post tech, how since 1986, which is about 30 years ago, has been able to get into the number 28 in world industry ranking. <coughs> none of the Malaysian university, none. None of the Malaysian university has ever got into the top 100 of QS, THE, or Shanghai Yatong, none. And UM has been around for 115 years, but never got into the top 100 yet. But this university in just 30 years has got into number 28 in THE, uh, in the QS Asian C ranking is number one, better than NUS, and so on. Uh, one of the top global innovators and uh, among the top publishers. Amazing how this university in Korea has been able to do that. And I think for those doing MBA or whatever, this could be a good case study, kan? to understand how they did it. And I don't have all the answers, but I can, from their figures, from their income and so on, it should show you, uh, give some hints to that. Next slide. Okay, this is a small university. The number of professors is only 281. UM is about uh, eight times that, you see Malaya. Okay, the number of academics. The number of undergraduate, 1,449. So which means Sunway has got too many already. <laughs> <laughs> Graduate, a lot more. Masters and PhD. And then researchers, 611. But number of professors is only 281. How can this small university can be so powerful? Can you guess why? <coughs> okay, industry, yes. Anything else? Yes. Okay. Quality research. So please, before I reveal more, tell all those university owners if they are serious, you can be small, but you can be extremely powerful if you know what to look for. You can be big, but you can be nowhere if you do the wrong things. Look at the next slide. Okay, this is, uh, they, they are showing how the number of students, 
The number of professors has been built up throughout the years. Again, small. The numbers are small. Karen, no need for Sunway to recruit any more students. More than enough already, right? <laughs> Next slide. The tuition fees for the undergraduate, $4,800 uh, US dollar, graduate $7,000. I think some of the local private universities are around that already. Quite close, right? You agree? Some of the local private. Is that correct, Karen? Undergraduate fee. So nearly there, right? But they are not in the top 100 universities yet. But this university has got there charging this kind of fees. Next slide. <coughs> Their revenue, Pohang, yeah? Pohang or Postec. Total revenue, $277 million, uh, $77 million. Research grant, $141 million. God. So, your professors, the one that you recruit, the superstar professors, the university president, the vice president for research, go out and get the money. I mean, who else, whose job is it to go and get the money, right? We pay you lah. How much you want? 30,000, 40,000 a month? Go and get the research money in. Their biggest income is research grant. So you are right to guess that it is because of research. Any of the nation universities can do this? <coughs> None. Can the Singapore universities do this? None. Actually, NUS and NTU, they are great because they are able to achieve very high ranking. But all of that is being pumped by the government, the money. But not as spectacular as this. Because I've, I've been looking at post tech how did they do it? This is really amazing. You see, the amount of research can we bring in is already a lot. And downward income. <clears throat> 54.1 million dollars endowment income. What I was talking just now, from that big money, certain portion become your endowment income. If the endowment income is US 54 million dollars, what do you think is actually the value of the endowment? Can you guess? If the endowment income is 54 million dollars, what do you think is the size of the endowment? The simple rule, of course, I cannot demonstrate here, is simple, time by 20. Because what goes to income is about 5% of total endowment. In other 5% goes back to the principal amount. That's like the normal. So, if 5% means 20 times. So, $1 billion. <coughs> $1 billion US dollar. And they have this endowment. How did they do it in just 30 years? So this university has got it right because the first thing they do is build an endowment. A big size endowment. So do you understand, sir, now why I say you want to build a private university, give it to the person who doesn't know what to do with money, right? <laughs> Rather than the person who needs this university for their living. You agree now? Yeah. Ah, this is the reason. And look at this, tuition fee is only $22.7 million, which is only 8.2%. Whereas a lot of the private industries here, 80% depends on it. You see the point, Karen? <laughs> <laughs> so it is a totally different model, totally different way of thinking. And I believe the minister, the minister of education should start looking at things in this light. Because the Korean has done it, I'm sure we can start cracking in that direction. Sorry? Of course. Yeah, I agree. I agree with that. That's why the Chinese schools are better equipped and so on. And so on, which is very correct. But when it comes to the university, if we look forward into competing in the ranking and so on, this is the direction. There's no other way. 
Because if you depend on government money, it depends on the economy. Economic downturn, your budget are cut. And it's interesting that ratio of endowment income to tuition is only 2.38, you know. Fantastic. Okay, next slide. These are uh, expenses. Where do they spend their money? Again, they spend a lot on research, salaries and wages. They spend a lot of money on research, and from the research, they get more money. They employ the best professors. They employ Nobel laureates to do top class research. This is where, if you employ the best people in your system, then you start attracting money into your university, and you start attracting the best students. Whereas you build a university where everything is halfway, then you won't be able to do that. So the key here is bring in the best professors and bring in the best students and find money to support the student and the professors. That is the way to do it. You see why? It is not bringing in mediocre academics or academics who are already past 60, you know? <laughs> like me. Don't employ me as a lecturer. You waste your money. <laughs> you get the point, Anna. So this is a very interesting model because <clears throat> their gamble in doing top quality research has been able to actually attract more funding into the system. And not only that, <clears throat> they have been able to grow their endowment, their gifts, and so on. And it is a 30-year-old university, and it is a university in Asia. It is not in the U.S. So if everybody has the right thinking, we can compete with the U.S. Next slide. I know time is running short. Anyway, this is how the money is being used just now. I, I won't go into this. Next slide. <laughs> Sorry for the <coughs> uh, very undiplomatic many wrongs. But what I want to say is companies or individuals have set up universities to make money. Isn't this correct? I have seen owners of college who are coming to see me say, hey, we can make so many million a year. This is a problem, okay? Political reasons and interference. When was the last time the government said moratorium, no more giving of university licenses? When did you first hear of that? When did you first hear about that? Long time ago, right? And you still see some new ones coming in, right? This is what I mean. The founders do not understand university models and funding. Certainly, they have to go and visit Pohang first, lah, right? <laughs> and understand the model. The board or management do not understand what constitutes a world-class university. No, you'll be surprised, actually. You think UM is the best in Malaysia. But there are people in UM who doesn't think that that's what we should be struggling for. I mean, I was a vice chancellor. There are many times when professors have told the powers up there to get rid of me. Because I'm not good for the nation, not good for this and not good for that. But of course, I gamble and I say I want to make UM number one and Alhamdulillah, you know. But this is what it is, so don't think that all the professors will agree with you. But one thing all the professors can agree, you know what is it? They want to be the vice chancellor. <laughs> all the professors think they can be the vice chancellor. You believe that? I'll be surprised if there are any professors that don't want the job. You know? The only place where I think you get 50 50 answer is in a private university like IUMW. If they have seen how the board meeting takes place, then they really think hard, you know. <laughs> because to be honest with you, you know, Hamza is very nice man, very diplomatic. But he doesn't tell you all the quarrels and sometimes the shouting we do. That happens in a private university. So you must uh, really be surprised why he's still alive today. Lack of good academic leaders. This is the biggest problem everywhere. I mean, with all due respect to my 
colleagues who are leading universities. I think quite a number of them not fit for the job. Not fit for the job. Sorry, they can be upset with me, fine. But when I see, the first thing you must not be is to be a nice man. If you want to be a good vice chancellor, don't always be a nice man. You believe in this theory? If, if your policy is you want to be nice to everybody, you are already gone. Three months into the job, I can say, forget it. Lah. He won't make it. But you cannot be a nasty man all the time also. So you must know when to be nice and when not to be nice. You know? But of course, to your wife should be all... <laughs> <laughs> I was scratch my head trying to think, when is it that I'm not nice to my wife? <laughs> because uh, I learned one lesson from somebody. He says that if you want to have a happy family, uh, just treat your wife well. Everything will be okay. <laughs> but when it comes to university, you have good, nice vice chancellor, Vice Chancellor who think that we should consult everybody to make a decision, you are in trouble. Because in the university, you can never consult all the professors. If you try to consult all the professors, at the end you think, my God, why am I doing this? You waste your time. So take some risk, be autocratic to an extent, go for it, <coughs> gamble on it. Right, Anna? Just like IUMW, if it had been sold, I would have been dubbed as failure for me. But it is still around. And IUMW is going to be one of the income earners for UM. If you look at the business plan in 2020, it's supposed to be making net of 20 to 30 million a year. With just about what? <coughs> a few thousand students. With 2006. If IUMW has a student population of 5,000, wow, 50 million a year easily. Then at that time, they understand why we have to do it, right? So take your gamble. Lah. At the moment, 50-50. At the beginning, I feel depressed <coughs> all the time. Why? Because the chairman tells me, I get to do it. Now it's okay. Lah. I think it is surviving. But... Every additional student is profit for, for IUMW now. You get the idea? I'm just mentioned four mega projects. Yes, one got off the way. But uh, God has it that I will not survive more than five years. He mentioned about three other projects, Health Metropolis. Well, actually, we already appointed all the consultants and so on. What delayed it was residents association who protested they don't want that hospital to be there, they just want it across the road. But somehow somebody who is supposed to bring it across the road didn't push for that idea, delayed it. He himself was not renewed. So that's the end of the story. And then the commercial development, 120 acres. Actually, we applied to DBKL, planning permission, uh, land use and so on, all approved. But after that, stop after I left. So this is the truth. Lah. Actually, th those projects are approved to be done, but in a public university or even in a private university, you have to have a pusher who keeps pushing. Who will tell the boss, look, do it or else forget it, lah. I'll, I'll resign today. You need people like that, betul tak? If not, macam tu lah. Everything stop. Right, Emla? <laughs> so that is just to add it. Going on, uh, of course, you know, the National Higher Education Strategic Plan never achieved. I don't want to go into details. Now you have the Malaysian Education Blueprint. I hope some is achieved, you know, but some of them I don't think can be achieved. The other thing that we have to get away is this also. Sometimes we think that the Western universities are always the best. I agree, a lot of them are really good, but things are changing. This millennium is the Asian millennium. Even the Australian Prime Minister, that lady, said that. We should be competing to be among the best in Asia because the world is looking in this direction. And, and, and a very huge population lives in Asia now. 
and we can be wealthy and we can go up in ranking and so on. So yes, we have to collaborate with everybody, but not everything that Trump is doing is correct, right? You agree with me? <laughs> I mean, I think Trump is useful in that sense. So, uh, there are good models in the West, but there are mistakes also. So we pick the good models and we should do that here. And I think if Malaysia, if Malaysians, if Asians work really hard and have the entrepreneurial spirit, we can really rise. It's all about working hard and very entrepreneurial. Right, Anna? It's all about that at the end of the day. And we just hope that board members, ministers, <coughs> uh, university founders, have that in their heart. Entrepreneurial and uh, has the courage to do things, you know. If we continue like before, whatever Sakina is doing, forget it, it won't happen. She can do all her study, all her research, give all the good recommendations, but at the end of the day, if all the board members are sleeping board members, it will just remain studies. Nothing more than that. And I'm telling that Sakina, that's the truth. That's why you actually have to shout. <laughs> I think your voice has to be a bit louder, the pitch. Start shouting and screaming until they cannot tahan you. So, okay lah. You know, a lot of things are approved because they get fed up with you. You know that? Because you have given all the rationale, that one agenda, already two and a half hours, there's nothing more to explain. What is the final thing you must do, Karen? What then? Shout. 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 To the top of your voice and say, okay, 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 okay. go ahead. <laughs> you, you think it is strange, but this is the truth. Yes, for two and a half hours, you explain everything, your rationale, whatever, until you have answered everything. And after you have answered everything, still they don't move. Finally, you have to shout. Sorry, I'm a vice chancellor who tells people to shout. But I think it is true. You have to push for it. <laughs> this is what I started by saying that actually the founders must have substantial wealth. Because the old model where people get into the business because after five years they want to list the college, that's already long gone. Those models cannot survive anymore. You know, and I'm sure you can imagine how many institutions that was very famous 30 years ago doesn't exist today. Isn't it? There are some very famous, uh, you have a son who wants to do accounting, you'll always think of this place. That, that thing doesn't exist anymore today. You see? I'm sure the owners make a lot of money. Okay? And I believe, but of course, these things are just my ideas, we must limit the fees charge. If you award somebody who wants a license, you award them, you say, fees are limited by this amount and you can only increase fees, but you must pitch that against inflation only. And I wonder how many of them are still willing to, to set up. Why I say pitch to 2013, actually a lot of fee increases was after 2013. All the college. It's like things going out of control. Well, when the economic problem was coming, when not enough PTPTN, at that point the minister was saying, we cannot give so much PTPTN loan out anymore. So all that you see the trigger. But at that point of time, that was actually roughly the correct price in Malaysia. Lah. I'm talking about total fees eh, for three years or four years program. I'm not talking about annual. So if you want to give somebody a university license, pitch everything to this amount. You cannot charge anything higher than this. If they want, take it. And not only that, they must put me endowment depending on how many students they want. So the bigger number of students, the bigger the endowment they have to put in. So this should be the new criteria in awarding licenses. Otherwise, you are at the mercy of businessmen who think that they can make money. I tell you, as of yesterday, still there are businessmen who talk like that to me. 
They want to set up a university because they want to make money. Again, I, I'm talking about very proactive, intelligent board to grow the endowment. So these must be people who are credible. These are people whom you set KPIs. Board members must have a KPI. And then you see a lot of people don't want to be board members, right? <laughs> but give them KPI, but give them good allowance. You know? Give them KPI, but give them good allowance. And, <clears throat> and then we must have an endowment fund management board. And uh, you must have good people like Hamza who actually uh, spend according to uh, value for money. So, ladies and gentlemen, <coughs> this was my last slide. What I want to say is this, that if we are to go forward building good institutions, <coughs> we cannot think like what it was in the past. Because I think what happens in the past, we have been conned by people who want to make money more than they say this is CSR. I'm not saying everybody. There are good people. Jeffrey Chia is one excellent person that, that I can vouch for it. Not that I want to do that one. I have no reason to do that. But he's putting every money back into the education system here, yes. <coughs> but where Sunway needs to do is the endowment part. That has to be done. Uh, <coughs> but a lot of businessmen who own colleges is because they want to make money for their pocket which is wrong. It cannot go on like that. Just watch and see, 10 years from now, how many of the existing universities are still around. I would predict at least 50% are gone. Sold. Combined. And not only private, even the public university. Trust me. If the budget is maintained like what it is, yet the people in the university, the board members, the chairman, the vice chancellor, all don't know what to do. The universities have to be shrunk, have to be merged, and so on. Definitely, because if there is no money, how do you support it? Or they increase student fees, which I think the government is not prepared to do, because that is very sensitive. Okay. So, I hope I've given, uh, painted the picture of what I see, how higher education is going to be from 10, 20 years from now. You know, <clears throat> before coming this morning, I was looking at a commencement speech by a chief judge in the U.S. in one of the universities, very interesting. This is a very unique commencement speech because when he says, not, I'm not going to wish you all good luck, that you will be this and do that. He said, I want you to fail. I want you to get divorced. I want you to go bankrupt. A chief judge saying this in a commencement speech. He said, I want you to taste all the pain in life. I'm not going to tell you, going to congratulate you, do well in this and so on. No. Because you only win, you only become really a star if you have gone through all this pain in life. Very interesting, right? So let us all fail. <laughs> <laughs> and some of you can fail many, many more times because you are still much younger than us, you know. Yeah, people like me all, <clears throat> one or two small failure, okay lah. But I won't risk my family lah kan, you know. <laughs> So thank you all for listening to this. I hope you have enjoyed the <laughs> seminar today. And I open up for questions. My name is Tan. I, I am, um, my background is engineering, so I am in the oil and gas industry. I also spent my early three years in, in the engine faculty at MU. And after that, I left. That's my brief background. And I found that your slide where the budget started from 1994, 95, it started going down. It's very interesting coming from oil industry that that is when the, when the oil price almost go down to 40, 50 percent, and which is still now from 100, 110, now to about 45 or so. You know, 
Now, in the oil index industry, the moment the oil price goes down, we know we are in deep trouble. They'll be restructuring. This is the real world, right? Company will restructure, give VSS and so on and so forth, including Petronas, which is all in the press. But I found that what is the university vice chancellor or management doing then? You know, knowing that oil price has come down, don't you see the scenario that your budget will be cut? So why all the shouting to say it's not fair and so on and so on? In the private sector, it's a very fair thing. Oil price goes down and still by $40, $50 per barrel, and it remains so. We don't know when it goes up. Everybody starts tightening the belts. You go to Miri, which is the oil in Thailand, huh? the whole town is very quiet. Before that, it's very noisy because a lot of money. So, what you say is true that perhaps the university have learned not living in the real world. They expect money to come in, and perhaps when the oil price goes up, in, the, in peace time, prepare for the worst time. And that's how I look at this thing. The other thing I like to look is that you say you want to get the best student. But I found that in Malaysia, the best students with 5A and now 10As are all sent overseas. Why are they sent overseas? Why can't they send it to a local university? Because it's very contrary to what you say, that unless you attract the best students, your university ranking is not going up. Imagine all the 10A students are distributed around the university or maybe all going to UM, make UM a premier university. Perhaps one way is to get UM up and the rest will follow up. You need one good one, perhaps to raise the rest. So maybe that's one of the ways in which that the government may save money. The other thing is that you raise up the standard because you are getting the best students. Now maybe your best student is going to Harvard, Cambridge, you are helping them to raise the standard, helping them to raise the IQ. But then you're lowering your own IQ here. Thank you very much. You see, uh, to run, to, to be a vice chancellor, to, to, to manage a public university, if you accept an offer to be a vice chancellor of public university, you have to accept that a lot of things will be unfair to you. This is the first premise. If you expect everything to be good for you, that's only a dream. When the government cut the budget, they say, do not increase the fees. In the US, they will increase the fee. Okay? That, 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 that's one thing. There are certain things when people complain, when students complain, you cannot reply that. You just have to accept it. So it's like going to a boxing match with your hands tied and do your best, like use your head or whatever, you know, and try to win. But of course, I must say, one of the biggest problems in the public institutions is that the management and also the board, if they are creative, if they are much more courageous, they can do much more than what it is today. Definitely. But the problem is a lot of them are conformists. They just follow. They just do what they are told. What they do is in their small domain, adjust this, adjust that. A vice chancellor will not dare to actually tell, okay, because our budget has been cut by 30%, so we have to remove 20% of the staff. He will never dare to do that because he will be out of his job very fast. You have to just swallow it. You know what I mean? Especially if the staff is already a permanent staff, there's no way you can remove them. Okay? <clears throat> so, sir, to answer you, you see the decline from the oil industry and so on. The university should have reacted better and so on. But at the same time, I also understand that the university's management and so on, a lot of them, they are tight. Their hands are tight. They, they, they cannot just do anything they want. For example, even though uh, budget has been cut, but they cannot remove staff, they must take the same number of students. They cannot decrease the number of students. Uh, so they, we are operating an environment like that. Of course, you are in the private sector, you decide lah, you and your board. 
but not in the public university. So it's a very fine balancing act. You know? Uh, in the public university, you can have five professors writing to the prime minister saying that, oh, this VC must be removed. They will go and see the prime minister and give 20 reasons why the vice chancellor must be removed. But you cannot do anything to the professor. You will still see the professor in whatever avenue and you have to be friendly with them. Can you be the vice chancellor? They have told the number one, say, remove him. But still you have to be friendly to them and so on. That's the, the situation you are operating in. Lah, you know? Because once you are tenured, it's very Im almost impossible to remove them unless they have committed a crime. That's a different matter. Next question. Um, yes, sir. Yes, ma'am. Hi. Um, yes. Ah, okay, after this, no. you're, you're Oh, yeah, carry on. Yeah. Three quick comments, if sure. I may. Sure. And the first is that if people want to follow up on Pohang, that there's a case study of it in that same publication, Road okay. to Academic Excellence. That's one of the 14 case studies. Is it a good case study? It's an excellent one. Excellent, yeah. yeah excellent one. And uh, secondly is that uh, just to show how meticulously Harvard maintains its money, um, every year uh, Harvard graduates receive a, a letter saying, if you want to uh, leave any money for the university, we will help you with drawing up of the will. <laughs> <laughs> and it does this annually. Um, third, uh, Tansri, you may have forgotten, but when I was researching the road to academic excellence, I had the good fortune to interview you. Yes. And then I asked you, should I keep back any information that you have told me in case it becomes a problem? And you said, no, put everything in that uh, report, warts and all. And we did, and we did, and that resonates with the point Professor Hamza said, that is, be very transparent. And so you were. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> by, by the way, uh, just like, like a joke, um, towards the end, last one year of my vice chancellorship, I don't know who, but somebody created a website, Tak Nak Kau Sebagai Naib Chancellor. It is still there, by the way. But it's okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, that's for Thank you uh, for sharing all the inside story. Okay, my concern, uh, I just interview, randomly interview one to two students from each of the public universities, how their experience of learning huh, in our public universities. And I was a graduate from UM for my first degree, 1988, graduated, and then second degree, 2013. Basically, I find it's still the same old orientation, where maybe uh, the lecturers are using PowerPoint now. Uh, basically, it's just reading out. So the students from UM was telling me those accounting with all the A's, straight A's, 13, 14 top students, including their metric, and all of them say they want to get out quickly and they want to join the private. Similarly, from UPM, Achilles Studies, from UKM, uh, in other fields. Uh, my question is, with all the money to promote this ranking, positioning, benchmarking at the world level, to what extent public universities like UM has benefited? Secondly, if the very key factor, the quality of excellence of academic are still not even changed in their command delivery process, not mentioning the command of knowledge and the delivery of knowledge, whether they can enlighten and ignite the fire in the students. What my concern is, I've, when I thought in the private sector, I f deliver the University of London program, I find I have been cheated totally when I did my first degree in UM, sociology. It's just reading out notes and very partially, not up to 20% of the curriculum. And the students were telling me the same thing now. And then even to pass exam is sorry. Yeah? I don't mean humiliating. Uh, they were telling me if no tips is given, practically they can't answer the questions. And even the, the answering exam question is sort of like, <laughs> you know what's a uh, mockery? Students didn't read as well with all these uh, A's. So the system go back to our, the, the, from the primary to secondary, like what our ministry is doing. But uh, very sad is all these called the creams, all the A's, including me, I have to obtain an A's to go to my, you know, faculty. 
But I find the lecturers, the professor, faculty, so just now the sharing of international uh, UN views, if I'm a researcher in the private sector, it would be very, this is a brand, but why it cannot sell, why it doesn't appeal to us. So how would this question be to be addressed in a sense, even to push up all the ranking, to what extent is going to sustain, how it benefit our society, our country, our people, and our students' learning experience in the institution. Thank you. Uh, when I was brought in as Vice Chancellor of UM, that was in 2008, the percentage of staff with PhD was only 60 over percent. If we are talking about universities that want to be in the top 100, it should be 95 percent. I went to a university in Brazil, Universitas de Campinas. I was shocked to find that university, 99 percent of the staff has PhD. A university in Brazil. But in of Malaya, among the top you see, doesn't have that. And when I started studying the problem, why is it that so high percentage of them didn't have PhD? Because some of them had gone to do PhD, didn't complete it. So what I did, uh, I issued out a Reminder to all staff, by this date, all of you who has not got their PhD and who has been given scholarship to do PhD must get it, or else I will start cutting salaries. So I started cutting salaries. The first year, I cut 200 every month. The next year, 400 and on an increasing scale. At the point I left, 85% of the staff has PhD after five years. Now, this is just to illustrate to you, ma'am, <coughs> that actually there are uh, still a lot of things to be corrected. Because actually when I was brought in as vice chancellor, what the interview panel was said, look, UM dah jatuh, dia punya ranking dah jatuh, now USM is already appointed as the APEX University. What are you going to do about it? They told me this. So, we are not denying what you say, things have been going down but to correct some of these things i think it will take 10 to 20 years especially when lousy stuff are already in the system you have to wait for them to retire and now if the government keeps increasing the retirement age is even worse you know what i mean nah. but i must say that uh, when I was there, we began to set new criteria for taking in staff. Where it is not easy to be even to be appointed as a lecturer. They have to be good in so many things. That made the difference. But of course then, after uh, what happens that there will be a portion which is very, very good. There's a portion which is what they call dead wood. So to answer your question, to transform UM, I think Sakina may have said this, that to transform it takes years. And I hope whoever comes after me also can keep on doing the transformation. Okay? I'm sure Punya Murti who comes from UM understand what I'm saying. Is that correct, sir? Yeah. Hmm. So the transformation takes time. Yes, I admit uh, what you're saying but because it's an old university and because it's a government university, you can push, but you have to observe certain rules. Now, what is the importance of ranking? A ranking is absolutely important, extremely important for UM. Your, na your name is Karen, right? Do you think you'd like to see me give a talk here if UM actually in Malaysia is number five? Do you think you are keen to come here this morning? See, she's just looking at my face without any response. <laughs> what I'm saying is that if UM had been number one and suddenly is number five, and here I, I come to talk about my experience as vice chancellor, what do you think of me? I didn't know you're very quiet, you know. <laughs> So that's what I mean. And not only that, 
you can go and talk to the Dean of Engineering, by the way, the Engineering Faculty of UM. Electrical Engineering is ranked number 23 in the world, by the way. Chemical Engineering number, I can't remember, must be 35 or 45 in the world, you know, according to QS subject ranking. You can talk to Dean of Engineering how when this ranking keeps going up, industry wants to talk to them. And they even tell me there are Japanese companies that insisted that when they come to Indonesia, they only want to talk to UM. They don't want to talk to anybody else. Why? Because of the ranking. And by the way, do you know that UM, while it is ranked 140, right, is the best university in the Islamic world? I mean, among all universities in all the Islamic countries, UM is the top, by the way. And for those from the Islamic world that knows about university, they think there's something there. So if people think of you good, if you create a good impression, it's easy to talk to people, right? I think there's an advantage. And this is exactly the reason why Sunway now or UTP or Taylor's is all talking about how to improve their ranking because of this. And not only that, in the star rating for all the universities now, a lot of the criteria of QS is already inside it. Uh, so you see why actually at the end of the day, it is important to have a position in the ranking and it must keep going up. And why is it a very top class university like Melbourne, La, Harvard, La, whatever, they always say what rank they are in QS, in THE, in Shanghai, Jiaoting ranking and so on. You know, the, what they are saying, they are numbers, but you know to get into that position is damn tough. It's not easy. So there must be something there. Lah. So you see, even with some academics who are almost lousy in the UM system, we still can make it. Imagine if we can remove the 20% dead wood, wow, we will be in the top 50 easily. Right or not? But I must admit there are dead woods in the UM system. They are. So this is a fact of the matter. Lah. Thank you. Last question. Anybody? Yes, sir. Thank uh, you. Um, I understand uh, UM is one of the apex city in Malaysia. No, only no. USM. Oh, USM. Okay. Okay. Uh, sorry. No advantage anyway. <laughs> okay. But I have the privilege uh, to meet up with one of the dean in MU. Uh, it's in the science faculty don't want to be specific. Uh, he also complained that uh, the students under his faculty is chosen by UPU, okay? And whatever students he get, uh, to him is second or third class students. That means even the student doesn't apply that particular course uh, as their first choice, but somehow they just put them there uh, just to make up the quota or whatever. Uh, so you see, uh, I look at it, uh, if you say you want to be the best university in Malaysia and so on, your, your students are not interested in that particular subject. Somehow maybe financially they are not so uh, well, they got no choice but uh, as a last resort they get into that particular course. So I look at it during my time. MU was, you know, public U. If you can get into public U, one of the top is considered good. But now I think people prefer those with a bit of financial, not very rich, prefers to go to private. At least they can choose whatever course they want. And think, I think in the private sector, if a student graduates from public U and a private U, some of the good private U, they prefer students from there. Your comments, please. Yes. Okay. The intake of uh, students to the public university, to be very honest with you, we are not entirely autonomous. It's still, at the end of the day, the ministry will give the final list. But for professional courses like medicine, engineering, dentistry, accounting, law, and all that, you can be very sure that UM gets the best the lousy never gets into those programs. That I can guarantee you. 
okay, engineering, medicine, accounting, dentistry, or pharmacy even. To get to medicine, you must get four out of four CGPA. In fact, there are some who get four out of four, so cannot get to medicine. So those professional program no issue. But there are some courses in UM, University of Malaya, where they say they want to take 40 students, they cannot get the 40 students. So what they do is, they take other students and fill that up. So these are the category of people where I didn't apply for this course that they gave me this. Uh, that's the thing. You know what I mean? Uh, this is why that sort of happened. How come they give the student a certain bachelor degree program, they didn't even apply for that. Why? Because a particular course may have an allocation of 100 students, but they are they only able to get 90. So they will find 10 somewhere to fill it up. This is how it is done. Uh, that one is at the ministry level, how they do it. Uh, but for the professional all, there's no issue. But these are the perhaps the less popular course, lah. Uh, you know. And um, the, the other thing also, some people may be saying that hey, why the students' command of English is not really that good and all that. That one is the nationwide problem, usually. You know, this is, this is not just UM's problem. You, you know what I mean? This one, I think the, the ministry should answer these issues. Of course, at the university level, uh, there are courses, programs, and so on created to improve their command. But still, uh, maybe not good enough. Lah, you know? But I think technically, content-wise, all there is no issue to that. Lah. But certainly, sir, for UM to have risen from when I first started UM from a position of 230 and now 141, which has gone up by 100 over, that means there, there must be a group of very, very highly productive academics there. If not, it can never happen. Right, Anand? So this is, huh? 114. So, 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 but again, I'm saying not all UM academic staff are productive. No. That will require perhaps a staff vice chancellor to go on for 20 years and remove all that. But as you know, we only are appointed for three years, two years, and so on. And once our complexion changes, we we have to move on. You know, so consistency is not there, lah. But in some universities, a vice chancellor is appointed a lifetime. You know that? Certainly, if I'm not mistaken, the vice chancellor in the of Wales, Medwin Hughes, is appointed lifetime. He can be there forever until he dies, lah. Uh, but in Malaysia, three years, two years, sometimes one year, sometimes acting only. So this one only the government can answer. Lah. I, I, I don't know the answer to all that. So anyway, thank you very much for your time spent with us. I hope this has been useful to all of you.